Bien, buenas, buenas tardes, bienvenidos a todos. Hoy tenemos el gusto de tener en el coloquio a Alex Fink de la Queen Mary University of London y nos va a hablar de generalizaciones de matroides. La plática será en inglés. Thank you very much. I want to talk about matroid generalizations and in particular convey some of the reasons why I'm excited about my favorite one here. My favorite one will be evaluated matroids for those in the know, but more on that later. So uh, in a in a general audience talk like this, I guess the first thing to do is to introduce matroids. Uh, what are they? Uh, where do they come from? So matroids were, are a, a combinatorial structure, maybe one of the basic ones, like a graph or a post set or something. They came to be in 1935, give or take. They're actually a collection of, of different papers where the idea appeared uh, sort of for this, the same time. So. Uh, Whitney's work is well known, uh, and van der Verden is often cited in this connection. Uh, and lesser known, but uh, Nakasawa, a, a Japanese mathematician, also came up with this notion uh, all around 1935. And Nakasawa's work has kind of not been remembered as well as the others. Uh, The, the idea behind the definition uh, was to capture some of the simula similarities in the combinatorics of areas like graph theory and linear algebra and uh, transcendence degree of field extensions and uh, in particular the one similarity which will be captured in the definition I'm about to write down is this. Uh, so in linear algebra, you know, in our, in our undergraduate courses we all teach the Steinitz exchange axiom that if I have a basis for a vector space Uh, and then I have a second basis for the vector space, and I delete one of the elements of my first basis, well, I can always replace it with one of the elements of my second basis and retain the property of being a basis. Uh, so that's the Shannitz exchange axiom. And this, for instance, has counterparts in other settings. For instance, if I have a graph, uh, some kind of graph, whatever it looks like, and then I have a spanning tree of that graph, Maybe it's this one. And then I delete an edge of my spanning tree, like this. Well, any other spanning tree I might have had in this graph has to have at least one connection between this part and this part. And so there's necessarily at least one edge that I can put back in from whatever other spanning tree I might have. That will restore the property of being a spanning tree. And so this is. You know, if, if I replace basis with spanning tree, the combinatorial structure of, of this fact is exactly the same as the combinatorial structure of the Steinitz exchange axiom. And so this is what is captured in this definition of a matroid, one of several standard ones. So I have a finite set E, that's my vectors or my edges or my elements in a, in a field extension. Uh, uh, is a set of bases, which are subsets of E. And then there's just a few conditions, one trivial condition and one meaningful condition. The trivial condition is that there should be a basis. And the meaningful condition is, that, is the Steinitz condition. If I have two bases and an element of the first but not the second, there is some element of the second but not the first that I can replace it by. Uh, so that is A take away I union J is a basis. So that's, that's the Steinitz condition. And this, this condition on set systems is what Whitney and his uh, co-eval mathematicians took to be the definition of matroid. And so let me go through the kind of two standard examples. Uh, there are many standard examples, but so let's say I have a collection of vectors. And I just take the set of all bases 
suggested by the fact that I'm using the name basis here. So then the set of, uh, well, I'll call them vi1 to vir, so that this collection is a basis for v. This is a matroid. Uh, I'll call it a representable matroid. It's representable by vectors. Or I could have done the same with graphs. Uh, so let G be a graph. Simple graph, or need not be simple, need not avoid loops so it can have loops and such. So the set of sets of edges that are spanning trees. Maybe I'll say this is connected so that it has a spanning tree. Just for convenience sake, that's not very essential. This is another kind of matroid. These are called graphic. And you could say similarly, if I have a field, field extension and a collection of elements, uh, all of the transcendentally independent elements which generate the big field. That was the third standard example of matroid back from the 30s. So uh, these are the objects I want to generalize. So a few remarks on these. I mean, this, you know, if I have, say, a vector configuration, maybe I have my set of vectors, you know. Do an example of the example. So uh, what was my example? Like V1 v2, v3, v4 in c squared or something like this. All I'm remembering is the set of subsets of these which form a basis for the ambient vector space, in this case c2. Uh, that seems like relatively little information. You might think maybe that's not even all the combinatorics of this vector configuration, you know, much less the kind of algebraic information, but Okay, the matroid does, in fact, remember a lot of combinatorics. So uh, for any of the other, you know, basic linear algebra questions you might ask, like, is a, is a set of vectors independent, whether or not it's a basis? Does a set of vectors span, whether or not it's a basis? These kind of questions you can answer. You can reduce them to bases. So for instance, a set is independent if and only if it's a subset of some basis. A set spans if and only if it's a superset of some basis. So although I've kind of... You know, the axiom system is spare, like all good axiom systems are. You can extract uh, from, from here, you know, notions of independence or of spanning or of rank, the rank of a set being the dimension of the space it spans. Well, what's that? That's the largest cardinality of the intersection of the basis. And so knowing the bases does tell you at least a lot of the things which you'd think of as combinatorial linear algebraic information about a vector configuration. So it's, it's maybe still fairly, fairly thin amount of information, but it's not totally scarce. Uh, and it turns out that for each of these, I could have given an equivalent definition where I took you know, any of these to be the basic notion, but one definition is enough for us. Anyway, so at least all that kind of information is in there. And uh, let me talk about a few objects I can cook up from a vector configuration like this, because I want to relate to geometry. I want to show you that there is richer information than just this kind of basic combinatorial information in there as well. So if I have a vector configuration like this, well, I can view it as a list of vectors, right? In this case, let's make it in R2 so that I can literally draw it. All right, this is really just literally a set of vectors in R2. Uh, V1 uh, up here, V2, I'll draw them as points. You can think of them as vectors, V3, uh, V4. Uh, but you know, there are other geometric avatars of this. So for instance, I might want to make uh, you know, look in the dual vector space, I can make a hyperplane arrangement, and now there's more geometry. I can look at, you know, the complement of the hyperplane arrangement and ask geometric questions about it. So, uh, you know, from, from a linear, from a representable matroid, 
well, from this data v1 through to vn, I get a hyperplane arrangement. Uh, for each vector, I look at its annihilator in the dual linear space, that's a hyperplane, and so each vector gives me a hyperplane. Uh, so this is like the set, the collection of all the hyperplanes. Hi is going to be just the perpendicular to Vi, which is a hyperplane in the dual vector space, one of those for each element of the ground set. So that's a hyperplane arrangement. So here are my vectors. And in R2 dual, well, what do I have? I have uh, H1 looks like this. H2 looks the same way, because these two things are parallel. H3 looks like this. Uh, H4. And so I have this, this hyperplane arrangement. And in particular, I'm interested in uh, the complement. So I might want to look at uh, the take this arrangement and subtract all of the hyperplanes. That is some, well, it's some set. You know, in, the, in this real setting, you know, it's, it's, it's some disconnected set of open polyhedral cones. But I might have questions about this, right? So, uh, for instance, I could ask over R, how many pieces are there? How many connected components has the complement got? Uh, or I might ask, let's say I'm working over a finite field, a field of order Q. You know, I might ask, well, how many points? This is now F, a vector space, finite dimensional vector space, where FQ is a finite set. I take out these hyperplanes, I'm looking for some finite set. I can count it. I can do some combinatorics that way. And, well, in fact, this gives, you know, uh, this uh, actually had many connections to graph coloring. I shouldn't say just the four color theory, but what's going on is, let's say I want to take my graph and color it with elements of the finite field of order Q. Maybe my, maybe I'm using like the finite field of order three, so I have zero, one, and two, then I can color this graph something like this, assigning uh, no two vertices the same field element if they're connected by an edge. This is a proper coloring of the graph, and in graph coloring we're interested in whether these exist, like the four color theorem said that if I had a planar graph and I used the field of order four, of course I'm not using the field structure, but if I use the field of order four and a planar graph, then there should be one of these things. So if I could count the points, right, each of these conditions, this color is not that color, that's a hyperplane. It says this value does not equal that value. This, when this value equals that value, that's a hyperplane. So I just want points that aren't on any of these hyperplanes. So if I could count these points, you know, maybe that's an approach to the four color theorem. Turns out the four color theorem is harder than that, but you can say a lot of elucidating things that way. Uh, or, okay, let's do some situations with more geometry. You know, maybe we could say, if I'm over the complex numbers, well, a hyperplane in the complex space is real co-dimension two. And so this thing isn't just disconnected, but it actually has some non-trivial homology. And so maybe I could ask, uh, you know, what is this homology? You know, take your favorite homology theory. Maybe it's, it's Durham cohomology of my vector space uh, V dual minus all of the hyperplanes over, I don't know, let's take C coefficients. You could take Z coefficients. Uh, that's now, you know, that's not just a numerative question, right? I mean, the answer is, is a ring. Or, you know, another kind of geometric compact question I could ask is, can I make a nice compactification of this guy? If I want to compactify this variety, maybe I want to do it in a, in a normal crossings way. So if I had this complement, this black stuff, well, I could compactify it. Maybe I go to projective space. And if I put these three red things back in, then I have three divisors meeting in co-dimension two, and, and that's an awkward thing for intersection theory and so forth. They're not transverse. So maybe, you know, I will ask this question somewhat vaguely, but, you know, find a, find a compactification. 
of this thing, uh, where boundary divisors are transverse. Uh, or I'll just say boundary divisors intersect nicely to, to keep the board vague. And so here are some of the kind of things I, you know, people often want to do with a hyperplane arrangement complement. And the brilliant thing about matroids is that uh, the matroid can do all of these things for you. So I guess, you know, collection of propositions, vague propositions, the matroid of the hyperplane arrangement, well, I guess I associate it to the vectors, knows all of these things. Uh, I, won't, I won't prove all of them. You know, maybe some of these are due to, what are some of the names? You know, Zaslavsky should go here, and others. Uh, this is, I am thinking of a contribution of Orlick and Solomon. This, I am, it's kind of De Concini and, and uh, De Concini and Procesi who started this, but this is just a representative sample of names. Uh, do, not, do not feel hurt if I omitted you. You know, dot, dot, dot. Many, many names could be attached to this because the theory of hyperplane arrangements is big. But uh, all of these people have proved that uh, ways to extract this data only from the matroid. So the matroid actually has a lot in it, which might not be clear at, at first glance. So just to show you uh, at least the way one of these is done, uh, you can construct the, the characteristic polynomial This is a univariate polynomial, and it's a sum over subsets of the ground set. It's in one variable, let me call that Q. Sum over all subsets of my finite set. And what I'll do, it'll be an alternating indicator, an alternating generating function of, well, R minus the rank of this subset, where rank, as I was saying, this is one of these notions. Uh, R, okay, what is R? R is the kind of dimension of the ambient space, so R is the size of any basis. All bases have the same size. Rank, as I was saying, the rank of a set is the dimension of the space it's bounded, is the largest intersection it has with a basis. So this is the maximum size of this intersection. That is a wild curl of B. So all of, all of this data resides in the matroid, so this polynomial resides in the matroid. And, well, the easiest one of these results says if I want to count the points that don't lie on the arrangement over a finite field, well, f, a, a vector space of dimension d over fq has q to the t points, and this is literally inclusion-exclusion for that problem. If I want to count the points that are on no hyperplane, I use the inclusion-exclusion formula for points which are on each hyperplane individually, I get precisely this formula. So the, the pleasant thing is that the surprise, the combinatorial surprise, is that if you put q equals negative one, you solve this problem. And if you put q equals q, you get the Poincaré polynomial for this problem. And so even this mere shadow of the matroid sees a lot of that data there. That's not someone in here. Okay. So uh, I say that by way of saying that indeed there's actually lots of geometric information in a matroid, kind of much more than this uh, small definition might have suggested at first. Uh, and what's particularly interesting is that uh, this invariant and many of these things, you know, can be done even if the matroid doesn't come from a vector configuration. So uh, I mentioned these representable matroids. And it's worth saying that non-representable matroids exist. Not every matroid, non-representable matroids exist. This is one of the key features of the theory, if you ask me. Uh, 
uh, there are matroids that don't come from a vector configuration and so naively have no geometry associated with them. So here is kind of the, the easiest example to draw. The easiest example to draw is the non-Pappus matroid. And I will draw it kind of in the projectivization of this picture. So it's a rank three thing, but instead of nine vectors in, in R3 or K to the three, I will draw nine vectors in projective two space. And then if there are linear dependences, that means that three of my vectors in P2 line, line a line, so I can draw lines through them. And so, you know, I can do something like this. Uh, take six, ve six vectors, which lie on lines like this, draw a hexagon, which alternates between them like this. And it is a theorem of projective geometry, already known to the Greeks, Pappas was, was Greek, that if I have a conic and a hexagon on it, and I look at the intersection of the diagonals uh, of alternate sides of the conic, then these three points are collinear. Proof works over any field. So what happens if I say, there's no line here in my matroid, I'm gonna say that those three things do form a basis. So I'll draw a line that misses one of them because I wanna say they are gonna count as independent in the matroid. Well, that's a perfectly valid matroid. No problem with this. This only detects like very local problems with the picture. Like if two lines met in two points, it would detect that, but it can't detect such a, you know, kind of ultimately algebraic you know, uh, problem as, as this, I guess this comes from the cayley bacharach theorem maybe ultimately. Uh, matroid can't see that, so this is a perfectly fine matroid, even though Papa said, if he'd known about fields, Papa would have said, you can't find vectors over any field that do this. And so, you know, you might think there are matroids out there which have no geometry. And, you know, what I think one of the richest part of the theory is, even if there are matroids out there that have no geometry, so you can't build the varieties you might want to build, Surprisingly often, you can build the combinatorial or discrete invariants of the varieties that you would want to build, and they have all the properties that you'd want as if they'd come from variety, except for the variety not existing. So there's some like ghosts of varieties that exist for any matroid, and they do everything they should. You know, aside from being ghosts, there's nothing wrong with them. And I hope to end by saying a little bit about this how to pursue how cats thing, which is a nice illustration of this point. Uh, so far, so good? All right, so the title was, was Matroid Generalizations, or at least it was before I moved it. So okay, let's look at some Matroid Generalizations. Uh, so Matroids, as I've recorded them now, uh, they record kind of the combinatorial information of linear dependence, which is all well and good, but maybe there is some combinatorics uh, in your field already. So maybe you don't want to just capture uh, what the bases are, but for instance, maybe your field is the real numbers. And in real numbers, a key thing about a hyperplane in a real vector space is that it has two sides. It has a positive side and a negative side. Or if you pick a defining vector, you know, I guess here I've picked by the choice of my v's, you know, I can look at where the pairing with v is actually positive. And this gives me a choice of positive side and negative side for each of these hyperplanes I've drawn. And so if you're actually doing combinatorics over the reals, you know, you might actually want to remember what the positive sides are and what the negative sides are. Like I might want to remember that in this, in this hyperplane arrangement, I can be on the negative side of P1, of H1, positive side of H2, positive side of H3, and the negative side of H4 simultaneously. If I'm standing here, I'll be on that constellation of signs. And that the matroid doesn't see anything about because it doesn't see anything about the field I'm using. It just sees kind of linear dependence over the field. And so the common theme of most of the matroid generalizations that have been cooked up is that uh, in addition to the linear algebra, we're going to stick in some of the discrete information that's already present in the field itself. And so the one I suggested here, uh, this was kind of the first of its kind. These, uh, you can define oriented matroids. These were due to Bland and Las Vernias in 78.
and kind of uh, the extra data which you're enriching the matroid with is signs in the real numbers or some other, you know, field, totally ordered field. Let's just say the real numbers. And so these are, these are useful for dealing with, for instance, if, if your graph was directed, uh, then you can say which side of the edge are you on. You get an oriented matroid. If you want to do, you know, prove things about polytopes or prove things about linear programming, oriented matroids are a very useful framework for that. You can state the uh, simplex algorithm for linear programming and all this kind of thing in terms of walking around in an oriented matroid. So oriented matroids are, are a useful gadget. The next one of these things to come out of the woodwork uh, is my favorite. Uh, and this is evaluated matroids, which are what I hope to sell to you here. I will, I will have them for sale at the end, going cheap. Uh, and so these are due to Dress and Wenzel in 1992. And okay, so you know, if I want to say where do they come from, well, where do they come from? They come from, let's suppose that my field has a non-Archimedean valuation, maybe it. So this is, you know, something like an absolute value, except instead of satisfying the triangle inequality, it satisfies a, a stronger form of the triangle inequality that makes it non-Archimedean. And so if my field is equipped with that, for whatever reason it might be, you know, maybe number theoretic reasons or something, uh, I can remember if I have a basis, not just the fact that it's a basis, but I can stick in the valuation of the determinant, say. Why ever do you want to do that? Well, I don't know, Dress and Wenzel want to do that. And they made this thing called evaluated matroid and figure out how to stuff that into the axiom system so you could have a nice object. And kind of then in, in recent years, this has gotten very hot. So uh, some topologists, Laura Anderson, Laura Anderson, sorry, uh, not a Hispanophone, and Emanuele De Lucchi, in 2012, we're looking at some of the topology you can do with this, like realizing these things using line arrangements, except that the lines might wiggle around like this. Maybe I should say sphere arrangements. They're really sphere arrangements. They're looking at that and thinking, is there a comparable theory for the complex numbers? Uh, so they invented these things called phase matroids, uh, where instead of looking at signs in R, you're looking at phases in, in the complex numbers and, and kind of they figured out a way to bake these into the matroid notions and they tried to do some combinatorial structure theory of these and, and their conclusion was, okay, well, oriented matroids have a very nice theory, value hidden matroids have a very nice theory, phase matroids are where all of your conjectures about what a matroid generalization should behave like, this is where they go to die. Phase matroids were just that bad. But the payoff from this was that they came up with a very nice unification of all of these generalizations. And so I should say, well, let me throw in uh, one more, maybe one generalization. Before I get to the unifications, maybe one generalization of a matroid is a linear space itself. Or, well, a linear space, these are in bijection with hyperplane arrangements. I'll, uh, this is gelfand mcpherson duality. I'll say a bit more about it soon. But, you know, instead of, you know, remembering just the signs or just the phases, just remember everything. Literally remember what configuration of vectors you started from. Uh, remember the vectors themselves. And, you know, on the scale of forget everything from the dependence information to forget nothing to, like, okay, remember the signs and forget the rest, you have this kind of this scale of things you might want to do. And so these are kind of common generalizations, and there's actually a number of these as well. Uh, and for historical precedence, the first one of these is also drew to uh, Dress, the same one who introduced these value hidden matroids. Uh, he invented this thing called a fuzzy ring. Whatever a fuzzy ring is, it's some funny algebraic structure weaker than a ring. Uh, and then more recently, uh, these inspired by the fact that this didn't work, uh, we had this notion of matroids over hyperfields. And uh, since this appeared, this uh, 
uh, is Nathan Baker, no, sorry, Matt Baker and Nathan Bowler in 2016. Uh, and this has caused quite, quite a feeding frenzy of results like this. I mean, we still don't know exactly what the right algebraic object is. I'll say what a hyperfield is, but maybe you don't want hyperfields. Maybe you want some generalization like partial hyperfields or tracts or pastures or some kind of crazy thing that comes from F1 geometry. And so there's all kinds of generalizations here. And this is, you know, this theory is currently hot in progress. We don't know what the right answer is, but at least, you know, by the, the, the moral here that by defining the right kind of algebraic structure and using it as your coordinate object, then you can just choose a coordinate object which, you know, is exactly as forgetful as you want it to be, from not forgetful at all to totally forgetful to intermediately forgetful. And that is the theme of these frameworks for the generalizations. And maybe I should show it, throw in that there's also some Metroid generalizations which don't quite fit this theory, and one of them is due to me. Uh, well, me and Luca Mochi. Metroids of modules over a ring. And this one, the correct citation, I, let, me, let me check. The correct citation for that is uh, the Dario and Mochi. And these don't quite fit the picture. They're sort of pariahs. So something I'm working on is trying to make them fit the picture. But for now, let's say no more of these. Let's stick to the orthodox stuff where it's kind of the name of the game is pick a generalized coefficient object. It won't be a field. It won't be a ring. It'll be something weird. And then try to do the algebra and the geometry using that coefficient object and see what comes out. So, in the assist board. Ow. All right. Oh. Uh. I will, I will pick matroids over hyperfields just because hyperfields have some pedigree. Hyperfields were actually introduced in 1935 as well, I believe, by Murty. So, kind of, okay, imprecise definition. Definition with some examples to make it more precise. Uh, the, the real definition is due to Murty in 1935. What, it's, what's a hyperfield? A hyperfield is like a field in addition can be multivalued. So I say like a field uh, because you take the field axioms, you figure out how you have to adjust them if you're going to have a multivalued addition operation, like you know, what should additive associativity say? What should the additive inverse law say? Well, you have to think about it a little bit, but you can uh, write out uh, what the correct generalization of the field axioms to, to this setting with uh, multi-valued addition is. And you get this class of objects called hyperfields. Hyperfields are wild and woolly, and the general hyperfield can be so bad that it's where things go to die. But at least, you know, there are some very nicely behaved hyperfields, and they encompass all of this. And so the point is, in particular, one construction of a hyperfield is take a field, take a subgroup of its multiplicative group, and then look at the cosets of that subgroup, as well as 0. 0 is kept separate. And well, if you want to sum two cosets, uh, the sum, you know, kind of the element-wise sum of two cosets will be a union of cosets, possibly including 0. And, and let's say you know, the values of the addition are any of the cosets in that union. Uh, that's a way to make a hyperfield. And that is a way that you can produce the hyperfield that gives you uh, all of what I call these orthodox generalizations. So examples, or maybe what I'll say is, uh, in, the, in kind of all the examples from the first part of my list, come, from using from hyperfields. There is a general definition of a matroid over hyperfields, uh, and you can put in a hyperfield and, and get an object out. So the first part of my list being, being this part. And this is, uh, and matroids themselves, this is the generality in which 
these people were working. So for instance, what if you want matroids themselves? Well, this is an object that's called the Krasner hyperfield. So I'm going to take a field. I'm going to take the whole multiplicative group as the subset of the multiplicative group. And I'm going to quotient by that. I'm going to collapse that. So now all I can see is if a number was 0 or not. 1 stands for not. 1 is the representative of not. OK. They multiply as you'd expect, given the way I wrote them as 0 and 1. How do they add? Here is your addition table. Well, 0 plus 0 is 0. 0 plus non-zero is non-zero. Non-zero plus 0 is non-zero. Non-zero plus non-zero, well, I don't know. There's the multivalued part. Uh, and these ones, as I say, just give you matroids. Uh, OK. Or you can do this hyperfield of signs. Uh, same kind of construction. You uh, look at, you know, plus and minus, reals, quotient, positive reals. And how do you add them? The usual way you do. Positive plus positive, well, OK, 0 plus anything is anything. Positive plus positive is positive. Negative plus negative is negative. Positive plus negative could be any sign. Negative plus positive could be any sign. And so the point of the theory is somehow that even though these hyperfields are objects with very weak algebraic structure, the parts of algebraic geometry that we need to work uh, to do uh, the, the foundations of matroid theory work. Uh, and I guess to be precise, the point is that uh, you, you can define the Grassmannian over a hyperfield. You can write down the equations for the Grassmannian in its Plicker embedding, and then just interpret those equations in a hyperfield and look for points on that thing, and uh, that will be the set of matroids over your hyperfield. So if you really put in a field, you get, you get these linear spaces back. That's a good thing. Right, what's going on? You take the set of linear spaces. Uh, well, the set of linear spaces, let's say, of dimension r in, well, I'll write little k to the n, where now little k to the n is a field. This is my Grassmannian. And this has a nice injection into the, I write down all the, you know, I write down, say, I take a, a, a set of generators from my linear space, and I write down their, their exterior product. And that gives me something in the rth graded component of the exterior algebra defined up to a scalar. And this thing is the Plicker embedding. And over here, I give it, well, projective coordinates. I have a, a set of kind of, I have a, a standard basis of this. And the wedges of the standard basis of this give me the standard basis of this. So a point in here can be written as some vector of indexed by the subsets uh, of my ground set of size 1 to r, or of size r, because these correspond the wedges uh, in the basis for this wedge product. And so I write down those coordinates, and that gives me a point in my Grassmannian, and that gives me a matroid. So you just write them down, except now they lie in your hyperfield, and you make sure they satisfy the equations of the Plucker embedding. This has nice quadratic equations. You make sure they satisfy these equations over the Plucker embedding, and you get the right notion. So for example, what's going on here? Let's say, now I'm using this hyperfield, I just say for each Plucker coordinate, is it 0 or 1? Well, if it's 0, then the determinant of that set of columns of my matrix is 0. That means it's not a basis. If it's non-zero, that means it is a basis. So if I write all this data down, what I'm writing down is the data for each set of vectors of the right size. Is it a basis or not? So you can see how this matches the definition of matroid I started with. And then you check, the, you translate the uh, quadratic Plucker equations, and they give you the, the definition I wrote down before. I won't work through this, but I mean, yeah, the brilliant insight of, of Baker and Bowler that you can get all of these matroid generalizations in this way. So in my remaining 20 minutes, I want to talk about my favorite matroid generalization, which is this evaluated matroids. And kind of the way I see them is, 
is like this. So matroids, you know, whether I have, actually let me, before I go on to that, let me state kind of a nice theorem. Uh, you know, why is this not just a fatuous exercise in making definitions? Why is it good? Uh, well, so this, okay, there are, there are two parts to the theorem with different attributions. There are equivalent. I said briefly at the start uh, that there's different definitions I could have given. I gave you the basis definition, but I could have actually told the definition in terms of some different data. For instance, I could have told it in terms of, you know, vectors in the linear space or sign patterns or not support patterns, rather, of vectors in the linear space. Or I could have told it in terms of, like, minimal linear dependencies. These things are called circuits. There's lots of different ways I could have chosen the data to write down as my definition. And the thing that makes this theory worthwhile is that several of these still work. You can still give different equivalent definitions, uh, and the geometry of the Grassmannian is basically survives enough uh, to make the theory work. So I was talking about Plucker coordinates. Those work. That's the definition of matroid I gave before. But you can also give, you know, the set of vectors in your linear space, in your notional linear space that this hyperfield Grassmannian is a moduli space of, you look at the sets of vectors of minimal support. This corresponds to the minimal dependencies. These are called circuits, because in the graph case, they're circuits. The minimal sets of edges in a graph that can't be in any spanning tree, well, those are the circuits, the cycles in the graph. So these things are called circuits. Or you can do it actually in terms of the set of all vectors in your vector space. And so this is nice. This equivalence between one and two is due to Baker and Bowler, 2016, and this equivalence is due to Laura Anderson in 2019. And so this is why this theory of matroids over hyperfield is worth taking at face value, because you don't just make a definition, you make a definition, you get a result about it that you can use these different tools. Okay, so what is my favorite matroid generalization? Now, I should learn how to do that gently. Let's lay the example up. So well, I guess I didn't write a section two when I said Metroid generalizations, but section three is my favorite generalization. And that is the evaluated matroid. And so I want to just talk about a few things that you can do with evaluated matroids, kind of exploiting the fact that they have some nice geometry. So if you're, if you're geometrically minded and you want to do something with matroids, it might be frustrating that all of these definitions of matroids are basically set systems. OK, this Plucker coordinate, well, I have this list of sets of size r, and I take a subset of it. It's a set system. It's a discrete object. I can do these as well, but these are also set systems. You know, I'd like to have some topological space to work with that's not just a discrete set of points. So how do you get a topological space to work with? Well, I don't know. By analogy, you're doing algebraic geometry over a finite field. Varieties are finite sets. How do you get a nice geometric space to work with? You take some field extension. OK, so let's take some hyperfield extension of this Krasner hyperfield. OK, well, this thing turns out to be algebraically closed. Any polynomial in this has a solution, either zero or non-zero. It's kind of coarse, so I'll have to make a transcendental extension. So let's imagine I want to take this thing, and I want to make a transcendental extension. Maybe I will put in a transcendental, call it T, and I will, uh, you know, so let's kind of do K, a join T, and I'll say, I mean, there's no, there's no formal theory of how to do the extensions, but this is, this is just kind of, you know, 1 plus t, I want to mod by 1 plus t is just going to be the set 1. Pick some equation, okay. You might think it's transcendental. Why do I get to mod by an equation? I do. 
I, okay, I do. All right, so what kind of things are in there? Well, okay, I can take powers of t. Uh, if I want this thing to be an a field, I can take neg positive and negative integer powers of t. Maybe I want to be algebraically closed, so I'll need to take rational powers of t as well. Maybe I want to be kind of topologically closed, take a completion. Now I can take real powers of t as well. Okay, so now I've got at least, in addition to my zero and my one, all my real powers of t. You look at what this equation does. Uh, well, I can multiply this equation by powers of t, and you see that kind of I don't get anything else but my real powers of t. And so now, uh, if I be, do some kind of construction of that flavor, uh, your set of elements is zero and t to a real power for each t. All right, I'm going to write that down kind of differently. I'm going to write that down in the, in the log base t perspective, so I don't always have to write t to the. So now if I take log base t, I get the tropical hyperfield, named after tropical geometry, which can be seen in retrospect as the geometry over this hyperfield. Okay, so I had all the real exponents on t, and I also had zero, so I have log base t of zero. I'm imagining t as being a number less than one, so when I take the log of zero, it goes to positive infinity sign convention. Let me pick that one. And now what's the addition table? Well, okay, let's say here's the, here's the addition, here's the multiplication. Multiplication is addition since I took log. Addition, well, it's kind of induced by this. This now says 0 plus 1 is 0. It'll turn out to be the minimum. So I get a set, I get this whole interval, if x equals y, but otherwise I get a singleton, if x doesn't equal y. And so you build using, using this theory, you know, I kind of take this, this transcendental extension, close it up in all the ways I want, and I get, well, a notion of matroids, but in particular, I get a strict generalization uh, of matroids because my original Krasner hyperfield uh, generalize matroids. So if I take just a plain old matroid, I can embed it in here. I'm using the infinity and the zero element now under this log morphism. But if I just write down only infinities and zeros, then my usual matroids fall in this set. And well, the point is that now uh, these things do have the promised geometry. So this theorem, these are nice topological spaces on which you can think geometrically. And I think Spire is the best attribution for this theorem. Again, there are lots of other people uh, whom I could attribute it to. Uh, but if I look at, well, I can look at the sets of vectors, right? This should be the analog of the linear space itself. This should be the geometric object. Uh, it's a polyhedral complex. So uh, 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 a nice familiar object in, well, it's in, in this t to the r, but that's just I take a polyhedral complex in r to the r and close it up to throw in infinities in the right places. And so I get a, you know, the, the subset, a priori arbitrary subset of t to the r, it's a nice polyhedral complex. And we can write it down explicitly in the case that we actually started with the matroid, and I'll do that. Uh, so if we actually started with the matroid, Oh, maybe I'll save that board. Uh, we actually started with the matroid, and we have a nice theorem which antedates that one. Uh, this one should be ascribed, I guess, to uh, where did it go? Bergman, or maybe Ardilla and Clivens. Which, you know, since we're getting near the end of the hour, I get to turn the imprecision up 
But that's okay. If M is a matroid, and I, you know, move it to T, I change base to T, and then I take this set of vectors. Uh, I'll say this is called the tropical linear space. So if I have an ordinary matroid, I can enrich the base and take this tropical linear space and I get something very predictable. Okay. Okay, I have, there are addenda here, like maybe I should say no loops. Is, okay, is in, in quotation marks, is the fan uh, over the order complex of non-trivial flats. A flat is, a flat is like the set of all vectors which live in a given vector space. So it's a set which if you add anything else, the rank goes up. We can detect rank from the matroid, so we can detect this from the matroid. Kind of uh, largest set of given rank. And so using this, if you have a matroid, you can write this thing down. It's, it's you know, a, it's an order complex of some post set. You can, you can get your hands on it very explicitly. Example, what are the flats? Well, in this example, kind of, the subspaces spanned by subsets of these vectors are uh, zero, that's trivial. This line, this line, this line, and the whole space, that's trivial. So really, I just get the fan over the order complex of a post set that looks like this. I've removed the bottom and the, removed the top, so I just get a thing with three rays. And indeed, that's what the tropical linear space for my example is going to look like. It's just going to be a nice little fan with three rays like that. Okay, why do I like these? Let me say uh, a few things about why I like these. I like these because you can do geometry with them. You can do things like, well, let me, let me finish by telling you quickly or without too much writing, two things that you can do with these. So. on two geometric things you can do with these tropical linear spaces. Uh, roughly, the first one is going to be intersect them, right? You can, if I have linear space, I can take their intersection. That's also linear space. Intersect them in the ambient space. And the second is going to be build some kind of cohomology theory internal to the linear space itself. And that's actually going to be much more interesting than you think if you think about cohomology theory of a linear space. But let me start with, with intersecting them. Uh, kind of one. So I have you know, I have two of these geometric things. These are linear spaces in whatever my, my hyperfield T notion is. And, you know, maybe I've got one here and I've got one here. Here's a line. Here's a line. Two lines in the plane intersect in a point, right? Intersection behaves well. And the cool thing is that this intersection, this actually realizes uh, something uh, realizes an old kind of uh, combinatorial operation that's very important in, in matroid algorithmics. And this obser observation is due to Spire. This is matroid union. So if I've got two matroids, the matroid union of them, it's like the uh, set is independent in the matroid union if it's the union of an independent set from each one. So this is an old notion in optimization, and it was kind of uh, the fact, let's see, who is this due to? I, I don't have the history completely in my head. Uh, but, uh, oh, I haven't written it down. It's probably people like Edmonds and so forth. You know, you're, if you're looking at problems like, oh, when can a 
You know, when can a subgraph of a graph be written as the union of two spanning trees? People were interested in algorithmically viable answers to that question. Well, we got them, and the way we got them was, well, a single spanning tree in a graph, uh, that's a matroid structure. So union of two matroids, uh, two spanning trees in a graph, that's union of an independent set in two matroids. Theorem, matroid unions are themselves matroids. Theorem, you can efficiently recognize whether something is independent in the union if you can efficiently recognize whether something's independent in the graph you started with. And so using this, there are a whole bunch of results in the 70s you know, by, by Edmonds and others about you know, things like recognizing graphs, you know, unions of trees and graphs, or, or partitioning structures in graphs, or you know, solving the Shannon switching game. And so it turns out, David, David Spire realized that intersecting these tropical linear spaces is exactly a geometric realization of these matroid unions. And so using this, uh, myself and uh, Jorge Alberto Orlarte have managed to prove a nice thing about the moduli of ways to write a given matroid as a union of rank one matroids, kind of enriching some work of Duvaldi, Mason, Dinault from the 70s. Uh, but maybe the one you know, that you all saw in the abstract and came here for is you know, kind of do cohomology theory inside them. And so this is, okay, you might think, why are you doing cohomology theory inside a linear space? You know, what will you get that way? Well, earlier on this board, I had written down that the matroid tells you a nice compactification of the hyperplane arrangement complement. And that's really what, you're, what you can see the cohomology of in the matroid. Uh, this compactification has all kinds of interesting boundary divisors. You blow up points like this, and so there really is an interesting cohomology theory. And uh, it turns out you can see it in this tropical linear space in a very natural way. You can kind of interpret uh, cohomology theory of toric varieties through these tropical linear spaces. Uh, there's a presentation due to Fulton of the cohomology theory of a toric variety, which says, well, it functions on this fan. This is a fan. Uh, the fan defining your toric variety, and, and you kind of take functions on your fan. Maybe there are higher dimensional cones. I want them to be polyhedral on each cone, modulo some relations. That gives the presentation of the cohomology ring of a toric variety. And kind of the cool thing is, okay, so this, the, you write down this thing for a, a Bergman fan, and you get this object known as a matroid chow ring. <coughs> Uh, this was, I guess, introduced by uh, Feichner and Yuzvinsky. So I take one of these tropical linear spaces and I write down this kind of polynomials on the fan and I get this thing. And the key thing is, well, if the matroid was realizable, it came from a variety. If the matroid was not realizable, it didn't come from a variety but it still behaves exactly like it had come from a variety. In fact, exactly like it had come from like a, a complex projective variety. So it has all of the nice properties uh, that Taylor uh, manifolds have in terms of their uh, cohomology or intersection theory. And so this is kind of the big result of Adipocid of Hutton Katz, figuring out that they could do all of this Kähler geometry on these matroid things, even when there wasn't an actual Kähler variety uh, around. So matroid chow rings uh, have the properties of cohomology of Kähler varieties, of Kähler manifolds. since I'm being super vague at this point for time. This is things like Poincaré duality and the Hodge-Riemann relations and hard left shot. So those are the three properties they consider criterial of uh, the cohomology of a Kähler manifold. And once you show this thing, then you prove, you know, you interpret some of the coefficients combinatorially and you prove the old conjecture uh, by Reed and Rota and Welsh that this is a log concave polynomial. And so they have an annals paper about this and are, you know, famed. And uh, it comes from this beautiful fact that 
even when Matroids don't give you a variety, they give you things you want from the variety. So that's where they're my favorite generalization, and I'll stop there. Thank you. I mean, so it, it literally is a cohomology ring of a toric variety, but it's a toric variety of a fan that's not complete like this, right? So the, so the variety is not complete. And so the, here I have an n-dimensional variety that's not complete. The surprising thing is that it's Chow equivalent to an r-dimensional variety, a smaller one that is complete, that comes from the realization. And so, yeah, it's, it, I guess, yeah. I don't know if I'm answering your question or just rambling but it comes from a toric variety, but the smaller Chow equivalent variety is only there if the matroid representable. There are, I mean, you know, you can generate arbitrarily many questions in this form, semi-matroids and so forth. And I think, I mean, I think there are, you know, there are people working on this. I think Amanda Deluc is interested in, in semi-matroids in particular. And, uh, it's, it's interesting. I, there's a chance you can do it, but there's a chance there'll be subtleties. No, go do it. You know, go tell us how it works. Happy to talk about it. Yes. Yeah. Uh, maybe not exactly, but if you, I mean, if you understood uh, the statement which I hid under here, you could probably guess the definition. Okay, so uh, you have all of these non-trivial flats. So these are the rays in here. So there's a these are like the boundary divisors in this in non-complete toric variety. So there's a generator for each one of those. Then there's relations for ones which don't span a cone. And then there's relations you have to mod out ambient linear functions for linear equivalence. And so maybe that you could guess. It's not exactly the same thing as the Ehrlich-Solomon algebra. We can deal with invariance using if not invariant. Uh, there is a connection. I think that oriented. No, it's not. It's it's you get you get these signed matroids. Uh, I have seen some connections here. If I have a not, let's see. Am I a topologist? Can I draw the trefoil? Okay. Maybe I haven't disproven myself to be a topologist. Uh, what do you do? If you have a, a not drawing, you can associate a graph to it, uh, this, this medial graph or whatever it's sometimes called, kind of, you put alternate regions and you go through the crossings and each crossing gets a sign according to whether like the, you know, whether this strand is on top or whether the other strand is on top, so plus or minus. And so you get this graph with signs on the edges it's a slightly different generalization than these, but you can cook it up to a, a matroid that remembers kind of the signings of the edges. And then, yeah, there are some relationships. Like, I think the, the, the Hom fly polynomial is, is bivariate, and pe you know, people know how to read one of the leading univariate polynomials of the Hom fly invariant from the matroid. So there are some connections. <laughs> 